and welcome back to Real Time Strategy, a podcast all about the gaming industry. I'm one of your hosts, Caitlin Redwing, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Sam Mosier. Today is a very exciting episode as we will be joined by Jordan Miner, games writer at PC Mag and author of the upcoming book, Video Game of the Year. Um, as you can see it on the screen, I'm also holding it up there. It's, it's a nice beefy book. It's got some good flop to it, if that's... Something I have else. one too. I have, <laughs> yeah. I have a whole bunch. You can all be holding up. We our can books. all hold up I've our got, books. I've got crates in the other room. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure your whole life is just you're surrounded by this book now. Um, basically, this book comes out on July 11th. It explores the world's most popular art form via insightful essays that highlight the best and most influential games from 1977 to 2022. Uh, Jordan has been an entertainment and technology journalist for many years and is currently an editor on the apps and gaming team at PC Mag. He's also written freelance articles for multiple prominent gaming outlets, including Kotaku, the AV Club, Paste Magazine, and more. So you've probably seen his name around and maybe you didn't even know it, or maybe you did, and you're really excited to hear from him today. I, I know we are. Um, but that said, Jordan, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm Really looking forward to talking to you about this book and just your journey in creating it. Um, Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited. It's all it's all real now. It's all happening. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, as your your press tour is is kicking off um, as you get closer to the release date. Um, we'd like to start today. Just we ask our guests kind of a get to know you question. This one is very topical because it has to do with your book. But I'd like to start off by asking. Since you wrote a book about game of the year picks, what is your ultimate like favorite game of the year? Um, I have to say two because I can't choose between these two. Um, and if you read the book, this is this is in there. Um, but my two favorite games are either StarCraft or Super Smash Brothers, just sort of mm -hmm. as a franchise as a whole. I think StarCraft is brilliant. It's like the new chess, um, and I think that Smash Brothers is such a great just encapsulation of so much varied gaming history and just a very cool fighting game as well yeah um, that i love it my brothers would love to hear that because i'm pretty sure the only video game they basically play is super smash brothers or at least one of them it is his life's blood i'm trying to find the yeah i really liked the smash brothers like section for ult ultimate oh my camera's gonna do that weird thing it's trying to not spoil it for you yeah <laughs> it is okay well it's not spoiled then you can kind of see sam you might have to show images of the book as we're talking i can um, be our reference man yeah it's a beautiful book but i did want to show that but my camera is finicky and i'll have to change that later on um yeah. Oh, StarCraft's a good picture. Oh, there, there it is. Yes. You can see our dog in that that illustration as well. Is that your dog? It's based on our dog, yeah. Oh, cool. I didn't realize the the artwork was like based on you and your life and I just thought they were just really good. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, you know, gamers just... love Easter eggs, so. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's more thrown in there as well. Um well, yeah. I mean, okay, so let's just talk about the book. I know we said it's video game of the year, but mm -hmm. um, do you want to talk a little bit like what does that mean? What is video game of the year? Um, just really what what is this book about? How did, how did you choose what the video game of the year would be? Sure. So video game of the year is a video game history book, um, and it's structured in that each chapter is an essay about what I argue is the most uh, important game of that year whether it's because it's a really good game, it could be a really influential game, it could be um, a game that sort of like foreshadowed later trends, or just a game I had a lot of personal opinions on. Um, so that, you know, that, that, kind of, that can take all sorts of forms about as to what constitutes something being a game of the year. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's the structure of it. And I hope that in having these, you know, these little episodes of these individual games, that by taking that all in as a whole, um, that the reader is left with a, a, a pretty comprehensive and like uh, sweeping, um, you know, uh, uh, retelling of video game history, you know, for for like half a century's worth of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you you mentioned that because they're your picks, you're you're expecting people to come at you with their pitchforks and fists raised to like 
oh, I can't believe you, know. you didn't choose my book, but no, your your reasoning is sound throughout, and I learned a lot while reading it. There's just there's I have a lot of gaps in my like gaming resume, I guess you can say, um, mm -hmm. or I just didn't realize the the cultural importance of some games. So. I, anybody who has an interest in video games, even if you're you're new to it or you've been around since the very beginning, I think there's something for everybody in it. Yeah, because because gaming is, itself is so kind of fetishizes being a new cutting edge thing that I think people kind of take for granted how old it actually is, and yeah. how much history has been built up in it, um, and just also the fact that a lot of younger people kind of gravitate towards games. Um, it's not it's not their fault that they're not going to care about like forty year old like arcade games and stuff. But it's interesting. It's interesting history. Yeah, it really is. Especially like, oh, I can't remember who was saying this or where I heard this. So if this is someone that just talked to me about it, I'm sorry, my memory is um, finicky, but they're kind of saying like kids nowadays or like teenagers, like gaming is no longer seen as like this nerdy like trend. It's really just like if you're a cool kid, I guess I could say in my quotes are around this word but like if you're cool and in with the trends you're playing video games now it's just it's it's reached that level of yeah it's just it's just ubiquitous yeah. yeah it's okay caitlin we can all you know validate that you are cool <laughs> thanks i you know what i have like the the ptsd of growing up as a kid and being like i want to go and, like play my game boy and everyone on the school ground is like playground was making fun of me and i'm like games are cool and they're like yeah okay nerd <laughs> look at me now all right <laughs> I'm, i mean i'm just meeting you for the first time and you seem pretty cool to me. oh thanks thanks <laughs> um yeah. oh. i was uh, so jordan i'm curious mm. as you note in the intro of the book that game of the year debates um are like part of part of your career specifically working in, in games media and, and writing was there like what gave you the inspiration to turn that into a book was it being in those conversations was it just the idea i want to write a book about games what is a format or a topic that would work what came first um yeah it was the idea that i think that would make a good format because there's you know there's other game history books out there um and there's other kind of attempts to kind of create like a canon of games um, but I thought that this format would would force a lot of really interesting decisions um, and kind of create a pretty approachable like narrative through line, you know, um, so that you wouldn't have to be bogged down with like like it also it would it would kind of kind of like um, it would kind of give equal weight to things that wouldn't necessarily have like that wouldn't kind of be on equal footing necessarily because if you just kind of take a you can see a version of this that just focuses only on old games, you know? Like, if you're talking about the most important games, a lot of old games would kind of get a lot of um, a boost if you just did it that, that way. And not, you know, deservedly so. But I think with this, it, it then it allowed me to include uh, some more modern stuff um, that is already pretty, you know, kind of some modern classics that I think are worth talking about as well. Yeah, I like the format, especially because, as you note again in the intro, that uh, many of these games could warrant their own book. Um, mm -hmm. And not just like some of the old ones, of course, like The Legend of Zelda or Pong or, you know, whatever have you, uh, but like Fortnite, Minecraft, those all are deserving of their own tomes as well. But it's really cool within, you know, these beautifully illustrated pages, as we'll discuss, uh, get the snapshot of history. Well, I was just, I was going to ask, like, while you were writing this, were there any like games that kind of came as a surprise to you when you were doing your research of like games that came out certain years where you're like, oh, like I didn't actually realize like how this game came to be or like how it influenced um, future games. Um, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I wrote this in a way that I think people can kind of skip around and sort of mm -hmm. kind of get, if they just want to read their own kind of favorite chapter, what interests them the most they can. But I think if they read it front to back, there are some interesting kind of patterns that um, that develop that even, like, I wasn't expecting. Um, like, you know, uh, 1989 is SimCity, uh, you know, a really important, really uh, well-regarded, you know, kind of, like, foundational simulation game, right? Um, you know, that leads to The Sims and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I did the chapter on Spore, which is where a lot of that stuff really kind of like hit the wall. Um, 
and couldn't, you know, that they hit their limit. They could not make a game that could, they, they, they weren't able to make a game that could simulate, in fact, all kinds of life from like a, like a microbe level to, you know, outer space and all that. Um, so that was kind of a sad ending to what was otherwise <laughs> a really important, influential uh, franchise. Um, but conversely, you know, you see also a game like The Legend of Zelda start off as, starts off fantastic. And mm -hmm. then you see the ways that it, it, it continues to evolve uh, up through like Wind Waker and up to now, you know, uh, Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. Yeah, I, I'm i looking forward to the, the future video game of the year book, which, what, Sam, did you say in the next, is there a second volume in the next 30 years? It's like, how, how does the Zelda franchise um, evolve over the next 30 years? Is Tears of the Kingdom it? Like, where, how do these franchises kind of like revitalize themselves and maybe don't end up the way Spore ended up? Uh, well, I think the, with, with that example, they should, they should realize they can't keep becoming bigger and bigger forever. Um, yeah. Which I think is a common issue with gaming right now, but maybe that's getting ahead to some of these other questions. <laughs> oh, it's, we jump around with our okay. topics, but yeah, that's, that is something I, I, I guess I'll ask you now. Yeah, it's just like sure. we are seeing games just become bigger and bigger and it really like leads to a lot of fatigue for gamers and you kind of get games that feel bloated because it's just like, oh, they're just like trying to be the biggest game or achieve some technical achievement when it's almost a detriment to the the core gameplay. Um, do you see this trend continuing? Or do you think that we're already kind of reaching the point where, where it's like that bubble is about to pop and we're going to kind of go back to, I don't want to say linear, but just smaller form games? Um, I don't know what will happen. I, I know what I would like to happen as I would like it to sort of roll back a little bit, I guess. Because it just feels like the mission returns to me. Of just yeah. Like, yeah, the games look better, but I feel like they're not... You know, like they're not like meaningfully better, or it's not really improving gameplay all that much, and it also just feels so unsustainable, just on like a labor angle too. Of just like clearly, like a lot of work and effort has been put into this, but like, was it like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not feeling that as a player in a way that, that felt like it was worth it to me. Like, I wish that time had been spent making like twice as many games that were like half as big or like look not quite as good. You know, right? I. Oh, I didn't even think about this while I was asking the question, but now I'm just reminding myself that like the Assassin's Creed, is it Mirage? What's yeah. the, yeah, like. That's the one coming up, yeah. That's the one coming up that it's like, it's almost like they realize that they can't just keep making Assassin's Creed games bigger and bigger. Just, yeah. I'm not sure how Valhalla performed, but like I know I played maybe 25 hours and then I was like, I'm done. I might have played a little bit more, but I, I didn't beat it. I don't think I finished. I don't know less. I think. Origins was the last one I finished. Um, and that's when they did their whole big switch over to this like way bigger format. Right. And like even Origins was like open world. It still was way smaller than Odyssey and Valhalla. And then they just like, it got so big. Um, so they're, they're kind of returning to their roots. I know they have other Assassin's Creed games in the work that are probably more along the Origins and Odyssey and Valhalla um structure but and, what, and whatever they end up doing with this whole kind of like like hub that they're doing i forget what it's called but Infinity. they're gonna have like yeah yeah, yeah. They're, yeah they're gonna have like smaller experiences within that larger framework or something i don't i can tell you i read so much about that trying to figure out what they what they meant by this hub i'm not entirely sure what the hub is and yeah. i don't know it's something to keep an eye on, um, something to think about. But yeah, that's I, I also would like for us to kind of scale back just a little bit, get more games that are more meaningful and less bloated. But I don't know. I say that, and I really struggled with Breath of the Wild when it came out because of how large it was. But like Tears of the Kingdom, the whole like what they've added to that has really changed how to play that game. So I'm not upset by how big that game is. And that's a game that's that's big in the meaningful ways. It's not like they, I don't think they, yeah. I wouldn't call the game bloated. It's all kind of like, yeah, material yeah, like the, the sky level and the underground. And it's like, there's all a purpose to it. It doesn't feel bloated. Um, anyways, we little side tangent over. 
So Jordan, mm -hmm. taking it back to, and this will, we can tie this topic into the, the writing of the, of this book, but you, you know, we talked about the format, what inspired it, how it allowed you to look at gaming history, not just at the beginning or in the middle and the end, but all encompassing from there. What was the writing process like? Um, was there certain chapters you immediately dove into because you knew how they were going to play out? Or was it first about figuring out how exactly the book would be structured? Because I just want to talk about the extra life sections for each year. Mm -hmm. um, well, all the decisions were made before any of the writing was done. That was part of the pitch with having on everything decided. Um, and so, you know, and also just in making that pitch, I kind of had to at least have like the kind of thesis for every pick um, kind of at that point. Um, so that was all done before I did a lot of the writing. Um, and then I did all the writing just sort of um, linearly, like uh, from beginning to end. I started with 77 and I just wrote it in order. Because um, I figured I didn't, I didn't want to do it where it's like, oh, let me write my favorite chapters first or something. Because then it's like, oh, but I, then the end of the process would be the most annoying. Um, I wanted to kind of just do it um, without prejudice, I guess. Um, <laughs> How I would have wrote it too. Just and then also again, that allowed me to kind of see these these potential kind of building threads um, kind of emerge uh, naturally as I'm going from beginning to end. Be like, oh, okay, that 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 thing I wrote about now could then come back into play in this this later chapter mm -hmm. um, in ways I maybe not even have predicted um, if I wrote it in order like that. Yeah, that's a cool element of the book because I think there are certain, in other hands, this book would turn out as just a snapshot of 45 different games um, and descriptions of them versus taking a bit more of a bird's eye view approach of like, you know, how did Super Mario Brothers lead to Donkey Kong Country 2 or as you've noted earlier, like SimCity lead to Spore. Mm -hmm. And so tell me, I'm always fascinated by like the getting the book made process what did that pitch look like um what you know you, you mentioned that you had all of your games picked going into that um what else did you need prepared or in your elevator pitch getting this made um you know i had a sample chapter ready at that point um you know my, my agent knowing that abrams might be a publisher that would go after this um uh, considering some other previous kind of pop culture history books um, and their um, ability to make a book that just looks really cool. Um, the imprint is called Abrams Image. Um, so just, you know, having having that kind of that aid from um, from an like industry perspective. Um, uh, but yeah, and then, you know, it's they, they, they like the whole pitch and they, they bought it and, you know, it was kind of off from there. And how how long did it take you to like write this essay, like just from when the pitch was accepted, so you had like your mm -hmm. thesis already drafted, but I would say maybe took about six months uh, for like the bulk of the writing um, in twenty twenty one. But then you know publishing is, is very slow for all, yeah. for all kinds of reasons. Um, Any you know, other you know then then and then all the contributor stuff that was all after um, my writing was all complete. That was all twenty twenty two was was wrangling all that stuff. Um, and then, you know, the, the art was its own process and everything. Um, but in terms of like the, like the vast majority of my like writing work was about six months in 2021. Oh, you're a much faster writer than me, which makes sense because that's your job is to well, be a writer. Also, again, the, the, the format helped too. Cause then it's like, well, this, I'm just knocking out, you know, this is, I'm not trying to I, help me break it up and not like see it as this gigantic project, but just as a series of very doable, right. you know, 2000, 1000 word ish essays which is a lot yeah. easier to wrap your head around. Yeah, that is. Um, oh, go ahead, Sam. Are you going to talk more about the extra life? Like, Well, it ties right into exactly what just Jordan said. We've made it long enough talking about this book without mentioning the incredible number of contributors um, that helped, uh, you know, that are in it, uh, friends of the show, like previous guest Tamar Hussein, who wrote about Bloodborne, uh, mm -hmm. Rebecca Valentine, amongst many, many others that, you know, thank you <laughs> for our <laughs> producer Ryan has all of the names up here right now. Uh, Jordan, was that part of the pitch process? Had you talked with any of these folks before that, or did that all come after your initial writing process? That was part of the pitch process. When we were even talking about what the book would be, that was there from the very beginning. Um, so that was always part of the plan. Um, but, and then, you know, I did, I did all my initial writing first cause I just wanted to kind of focus on that. Um, 
without having to then kind of wrangle all these people. Um, but once that was done and once we were like really, really into it, um, then yeah, I had, I had this whole list. We, you know, I, I was talking with my agent and people on their side and just like who we would kind of want for this, who I could could talk to, who, who's kind of more pie in the sky. Um, and then I was just, I was just sending like dozens and dozens of emails (laughs) and DMS to people. Um, you know, it was easier to once I was kind of also waiting until we could even t- say that the book existed publicly, because um, that was later, um, even after a lot of the writing was finished, that I could even like actually fully announce it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was that helped because then it's like, hey, this, is, this is a real thing that's happening, you know. Um, and then I then I knew, you know, just uh, what I could kind of I, I could give them more guidance at that point, too, as to what we were looking for. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. So then, Jordan, to get before we get into what these lovely guest contributors, uh, you know, how what what they can be found, how they can be found in the book, break down mm-hmm. a chapter for us. Um, how is it structured? What's you know what can you expect from the game of the year? And then tell listeners about and our our viewers uh, about the extra life section. Sure. So I'll, I'll break down um, the chapter on twenty nineteen. Um, cause you can read that chapter right now on Vulture. That's the sample chapter that went up. Um, so that is 2019. The game of the year pick for that is Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, um, which is a game that I'm personally not a big fan of, <laughs> but I recognize is very historically important cause it's, uh, it's a souls, it's a from software kind of souls game, um, which has been a really important force in gaming very in, you know, these past like 10 years or so. Um, so I picked that one cause that's the one I have the most kind of hands-on experience with besides Elden Ring. Uh, I had that funny anecdote of when I went to a preview event and hated it. Um, <laughs> and it allowed me, you know, that, that game came out exactly 10 years after Demon's Souls. Uh, so it's kind of, it kind of marks the point where this, this formula is really, it's not a fad, it's really around to stay. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that's interesting. That, that's a game I'm personally more critical of, but I think it's, it's still very much a game that deserves to be recognized here. Um, so that's the main chapter written by me. Um, I then also write a smaller essay on Disco Elysium, also from 2019. Um, that's at the end of the chapter. Um, yep. Um, so that's written by me as well. And then that one has three, actually, Extra Life sections. Um, it has another essay on Disco Elysium by Nick Capazzoli. And then it has two, it has uh, an essay on Bloodborne by Tamor. Mm-hmm. And it has an essay on Demon Souls by Scott Benson, um, which, you know, those are thematically appropriate. You know, those are tied in. Those are those are related to uh, to Sekiro, um, and they like they love those games, and their writing about them is beautiful and super well argued. And I'm really happy to provide that kind of counterbalance. Um, and you know, they um, that's 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 the structure for the rest of the chapters. You have my main chapter, another little chapter by me, another game from that year, and then anywhere between like one and three contributor chapters about either like another game from that year or a game that's sort of like thematically related to mm-hmm. the main chapter. Yeah, I really liked that, again, tying into this larger theme of how, what is the lineage of, the, of these games? How mm-hmm. is the history of these genres or gameplay design ideas all interconnected? Like reading about pixel junk at the end of the rock band chapter was something I, I I never would have been able to predict it before opening these these pages, but getting to see that was really cool. And I didn't give getting, them any like guidance or like that's what I was gonna I, ask. Yeah, I didn't tell them. I just I just told them. I gave them the list of other games that have been picked by other contributors. I didn't want any uh, double dipping there, and it still happened once actually. Um, <laughs> but beyond that, I'm like, go nuts. Um, I'll figure out a place to put them anywhere. You know, I mean, if I could if I could kind of critique myself a little bit, I think some of them could be a little random. You might argue, but I think that's also part of what's cool about the book. Is that you're kind of like, it, it makes it more nonlinear in a sense. That you could be reading a chapter, you could be reading like a, the Pac Man chapter, but then here's like a, a blurb on like Katamari Damacy from like 25 years later. You know? <laughs> yeah, some of them like you can see like themes of the kind of the games that they chose and how they tie into the game you chose. Um, but I did, I do like the little wild cards that are kind of thrown in there, and you just a lot of them I'm like, oh, I hadn't heard about this game, or like that's an interesting choice. We talked actually with Tamar yesterday, but the way the episodes will come out, it'll be multiple episodes ago, uh, where I talked about, and like, I just love reading about people who are really passionate about a game. Mm -hmm. And it's like, there are so many games in here where I'm like, oh, I really want to play that. Like, oh, there's like Soma was one. Um, Mm -hmm. 
it made me want to give Majora's Mask another try because that game scared me when I played many <laughs> years ago. Yeah, that's why I never put any limits on them. So I just want to be like, what are you just the most? What are you the most passionate about? I feel like that was the way to get the best writing out of these really talented writers. Yeah, I, think I they all delivered. I do too. It was. I just really loved lis listening. <laughs> I really loved reading their thoughts of <laughs> of games as well as yours. Jordan, what? Mm -hmm. From those, uh, you know, contributing writers, what entries surprised you? I, you don't have to list several at the risk of spoiling it, but was there one in particular that came in that, you know, you were particularly surprised to include in the book? Um, I really liked um, Mike Drucker's essay on Incredible Crisis. Um, I think his conclusion that it's just as bizarre now as it was at the time. Um, is really funny. I mean, he's a funny guy in general, but that's I really funny. I love Mike's writing, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a lot of fun. Um, um, uh, Trace Dean wrote about um, Tony Hawk um, and the way, and he, I, he's not really a huge gamer. He's like he's a comic writer I'm friends mm -hmm. with. Um, but I liked that approach. I liked his perspective as a non-gamer and how that game still appealed to him a lot, uh, especially as, like, as a quarantine game, which, you know, a lot of these... That, that that happened that you know this was written in the midst of all that so that definitely yeah. colors a lot of it i mean dear yeah your 2020 year animal crossing new horizons is mm. you you talk about how that was the quarantine game like if it had not been delayed and came out and was it supposed to be like december 2019 or uh yeah i don't know if they put a date on it but they were saying 2019 yeah it was something like that like if it had come out then it definitely would not have reached the success it did in 2020 because it just was with the timing and everybody at home what better mm -hmm. thing to do than play video games while you're at home and have a chill little game like animal crossing yeah <laughs> jordan a great part of books like this or like you know a thousand and one movies to watch before you die is like that that idea of the backlog um you know getting that historical context for the games we get now and of course with you writing it I am, you know, I imagine you at least had some familiarity with the the forty five games covered from between seventy seven and in two thousand twenty two, um, but with the guest con contributions, I that brings in games outside of your own perspective. Like, is there a game that hopped really high on your backlog um, after reading a certain submission? They're like, oh man, I really need to play this now. Um, I kept. It, it inspired me. It, it convinced me to give Outer Wilds another shot. That's another game I'm not, I'm not super, personally super into. I know that's another game I respect. is very well made um, and very good. Um, but I'm not super into. And I've given that multiple tries now, and I've, I keep bouncing off of it. But it did, it did give me to try that again, at least. Um, and also, I probably wouldn't have even given as much as um, Elden Ring as much of a try as I did, um, if not for um, you know Scott and Tamora's uh, Souls defenses in the Sekiro chapter. Yeah, I was going to say, I, that surprises me if you were not a Sekiro fan, but I'm kind of the same way where I didn't really like Souls games until Elden Ring, and I don't know, something about that game just kind of sucked me in. Yeah, I mean, it's the closest, it's, the, it's definitely the one, my, the one that I, I dislike the least, <laughs> uh, if that works. <laughs> I think the, the Souls fans will, hopefully they'll take that. No, that's fine. They've been nice in the comments on that article, actually. <laughs> that's so. good. It's funny you say that, though, uh, like, you know, to this answer, bringing up the Soulsborne games, bringing up Outer Wilds, because those are also games that I have immense respect for, but I have not fully clicked with yet. But mm -hmm. there's something about them that reading or listening to people's praises of them and, and why they connect with them so deeply, it makes me want to love them more than almost any game I personally love myself. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that, that that's great, and that's that's something that like games writing can provide to the whole uh, kind of gamer ecosystem. That I think is really undervalued. Um, like like criticism of a thing can help you really appreciate things and mm. want to get even more into them, and gives you a better understanding of them than you would have had yourself. Yeah, especially like no game's perfect. There's something to criticize about every mm. game that came out, and and I don't, I don't even criticism even in terms of just saying something negative. I mean, just in terms of just talking about something. Yeah. Just, like just breaking it down, breaking it down why it doesn't work or why it does work. So. Um, I'm gonna switch topics. We talked a little bit about the the artwork in this game, and it's just it's beautiful. And I'm 
I'm glad that there's like little touches of you in it and your life, the dog and some Easter eggs. Um, and I know the, the artwork is by artist Ren McDonald. Is that someone that you were friends with? Did you know before writing this book or was this something that the, the book publisher kind of connected with you on like, what was the process of kind of creating the art for this book? Sure. So the idea was to always have art in it. Um, and yeah, the publisher presented me with um, some options for, for potential illustrators um, about who they think they could get. And Ren stood out to me as far and away the, my, my most favorite. Um, I love his style. It's, it, it makes every, it really ties in everything together. Like it makes me a lot more cohesive games that otherwise look very different. Like Pong and Witcher look like completely different. Mm -hmm. um, but this art kind of brings them together into something that makes, um, that feels a lot more unified. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. And then some of these, some of these games that you, how would you even visualize some of these, like, like, you know, like Tetris we're looking at here, these falling blocks. Um, <laughs> there's so much, it's, there's so much energy and excitement to this. Um, yeah. I, I'm like, I want some of these as posters. Same. I told him this. Yeah. I would absolutely <laughs> take these as posters. Same. Um, he has a website for anybody who's interested. It's runmcdonald.com. You can see some of his other artwork and get the book. And then you can see all of his artwork for all of the games. Um, it really is a, a pleasure to like flip through and just look at some of the artwork if you're not in the mood to do some reading, but. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but once we, once we got Ren, um, then, you know, we did some samples and he presented kind of different approaches for how it could go. And what we ended up landing on was a kind of mix of scenes where like this GTA scene we're looking at, um, where you can see these characters sort of in the game, as well as scenes where you can see people playing the game. And I really liked having that mix because those those oh, those outside the game scenes also have like, you know, like you could tell that they're in the '90s or the '80s or something, kind of like those sort of like background details. And you can also see the consoles themselves. Yeah. Um, some of which are just very iconic looking in of themselves. Um, they'll be like, oh right, the the GameCube and the, the, <laughs> the original Xbox controller um, are just are just really fun things to see visualized as well. Yeah, I liked the. I was trying to find it. The rock band one. I won't show it because mm -hmm. um, of my screen and try not to show too much. But yeah, you, you get to see everyone holding all the rock band controllers or the the guitar and the drums. And you see like there's a sneaky little Xbox 360 in the corner. And yeah. It's... Yeah. Just seeing the ways that the games are actually a part of people's like real lives um, mm -hmm. was something that I wanted the art to get across and it, it does it's it's stunning <laughs> it's, it's yeah. gorgeous it really is yeah, yeah. um he could do we'll like put a out a like... call now to ren and abrams to get the posters out for all yeah. these games because like you i mean so many of these have so many passionate fan bases whether it is something like final fantasy 7 or or wind waker or like <laughs> you you can see those fan bases gobbling up those posters real quickly <laughs> Yeah, not that I need any more artwork to just like <laughs> sit in my closet because I haven't like framed so much stuff. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, even if you don't think that you'd be interested in reading like a hundred thousand words on game history, like just the art itself, I think makes a book more than worth it, frankly. Yeah, and like just like even the outside is just so like pretty as my camera really is. I'll show it up. It's not... got a really nice texture to it too, which might be hard to read yeah. um, over the camera, but. Um, the the buttons and the controllers uh the the controller like sticks um have like a nice glossiness to them which i would definitely recommend yeah yeah the physical version i mean if, if you buy any version you buy i'm, I'm grateful for obviously but if you're gonna buy it uh, the physical version is the way to go yeah because i i know we got the the ebook version as well and that's what i started with and i was like oh this, like, this looks really nice and then i got the physical one a few days later and i was like oh my goodness like <laughs> i love this this is going to live on my coffee table and be a staple in my i do book. have to ask on that note um as somebody who you know is, as much as love my love my career love this digital landscape we live in uh, but like, it can be hard to get your hands on a physical piece of work that you do. Mm -hmm. I'm long past the days of my middle school art classes where I could bring home something that I could hand and be like, I did this myself. Jordan, how did it feel when you got your first copy, printed copy of this book in your hands? Oh, that wasn't even that long ago. Um, mm -hmm. and it was, it was fantastic. Um, 
especially as a internet writer um i've been writing online for years and years now and i've seen my work just vanish because sites go away and you know companies get bought and whatnot um so just being able to have my opinions in a physical object was very uh meaningful to me um and say so, you know not just one but uh, again i have crates full of them in the other room so <laughs> Uh, that was that was that was really cool. Before we leave the uh, the topic of the illustrations working with Ren, how what was that collaboration process like? Were you sitting down with Ren for each year, or um, were were you give them a bit more autonomy to come with you with to ideas and then work on the iteration process? Um, so I wasn't actually super directly in that. That was more through the publisher and the editor. Um. But I know that Ren was able to read the chapters and that was kind of, that was providing some of the, the guidance for the, for how we, how we visualize some of the scenes. Um, and then, you know, I, I provided like some reference photos of our dog and, and stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, I helped, you know, I helped pick Ren in the first place and I helped us kind of decide this sort of hybrid style of, of outside and inside the game. Um, but after that, um, it was, it was more so Ren working with the editor. Um, but you know, the, the editor, Connor Leonard, he did a fantastic job too. He, you know, he brought a lot of, um, he brought a lot of, you know, just being a, a good, you know, just editor of words, but also he had a brought, he brought a lot of gaming knowledge uh, to the project as well that I really appreciated. Um, so I, I trusted him completely to, to, to maintain the vision of the book and, and improve it in ways that I, I didn't, I couldn't have done myself because I, I don't, I don't make books. <laughs> this is my first book, you know, I don't know. I don't know all that stuff. Yeah, they they did a really good job. Like the production value for this book is really high. I can't like show it, but I am a huge book nerd and have like messed with like typesets and uh, published my own books just like in school. Thought I was going to go into publishing. I mean, they just the quality of this is really nice, and they just really knocked it out of the park with how they designed everything in the. The fonts they chose. I know that's such a like nerdy thing to say, but I just really appreciate I did, a well-made. I did help with some of that. I did you help did? With some of that. They, they did present me some kind of style options, and I'd be like, I like this one the most. Yeah. Well, you chose really well because it just it all is visually pleasing and fun. It's it's not overwhelming. And it just feels like a a book about video games. Yeah. This idea that it's almost kind of like um like a magazine, like an old yeah. kind of gaming magazine in some of the oh. the kind of the texture of some of the like background colors yeah. and stuff. Miss, miss those. <laughs> yeah. I, lo I love that. Um, it's cool. You know, we, t we were talking about all these lineage and connections between some of our favorite titles. Like, you know, one of the things I love about Smash Brothers, which is, you know, discussed in this book is how it's able to turn all of these stylistically and aesthetically different things and somehow make them all feel at home under this one umbrella. And it's cool that you and Ren were able to do the same thing with all the books yes, know, captured in this game. Yes, that's absolutely it. That's absolutely the approach, to, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, doing the same kind of thing, the, how that turns game history into you know, this unified thing. Um, so, I'm, so I'm glad that you that you got that connection. Yeah, for sure. And, and now to continue this Smash Brothers analogy, uh, mm -hmm. the fighters, if you will. You talked about when you brought to the pitch process, you had your list of games ready. Um, we won't, you know, won't ask you, and we, we don't want to spoil all of them, but like when putting together that list, what was one of the easiest ones to pick? Like you knew this year had to be this game. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, stuff like Mario Brothers and Zelda and Dragon Quest and you know, Sonic and Wolfenstein. Some games and, you know, just had to be yeah, on there. Games are just so emblematic of what, of just, they're just so obviously foundational. Um, those were, yeah, a lot of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so a lot of it just fell into place. Like, you know, Tetris, um, Pac-Man, you know, Fortnite and Minecraft have to be in the book. Um, and and you say that, but like, it's, I think if you had asked me before picking up the book, I would have been like, oh yeah, Breath of the Wild, obviously for 2017. Right. Uh, but in retrospect, you were a hundred percent right picking Fortnite for twenty seventeen in this book. Like how influential and, and titanic that game is, and not just like the game itself, but the way it has shaped trends and how you know games are made nowadays. Yeah, I, just to add on that, because I also was shocked to see Fortnite. I was pleased, especially after reading you mentioned like maybe like when it came out, it might not have been like the pick, but just the way that like when Fortnite really found its footing like what it is 
in the cultural like world um it, it's just an it's an easy pick now to look back and be like yeah fortnite has like changed gaming and yeah it's a cultural phenomenon um because you know I, I want people I, I hope that people who care about games get a lot of this i think i go pretty in depth in a lot of a lot of subjects but i also think that or i try to have it so that people who don't know anything about games can read through this whole thing and kind of get a gist of everything mm -hmm. um and i think that they would be like i've heard of fortnite that seems like a big thing <laughs> that's that'll be uh yeah, they're like oh i see those like my, my kid keeps asking for these fortnite cards when i'm at the <laughs> checkout at the grocery store i don't know what it is yeah. what's a v buck yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then on the flip side jordan was there a kill your darlings moment is there a certain game that just didn't make sense in the book that you would have loved to include it in some way uh yeah i mean i would have loved to include uh burnout paradise oh. um i love that game i think it's like a, a an s tier a god tier racing game um i, I talk about a little bit i have there's a section on forza horizon um in there which kind of has kind of um carried that torch as far as more racing games go um but i would have loved to include burnout paradise in there um i would have loved to include a game like you know like donkey kong jungle beat is a game that i love <laughs> um or like dj hero um all, all sorts of like random wii games i love a lot that i don't you know that don't really make sense to put in here but games like silent hill shattered memories i love mm -hmm. um a game like her story or like immortality mm -hmm. recently would have been great um there's, you know, there's all, all, sorts, all sorts of games. You I, need I love, like a, have opinions on, but. the non video game of the year. Like that's the next book. <laughs> and it's just, yeah, it's all, just, it's, just <laughs> it's all takes. I mean, having, having these other blurbs in there was a way to kind of get some of that in there. But yeah. Even, even with that, uh, frog fraction, the frog fractions, that was a game I can't write about. Cause if you write about it, then you, that ruins it. People should play that without knowing absolutely zero about what it is. So that's, fine. that's how I feel about the outer wilds. Like I see that very I have, like, different no, kind of tones. Of yeah, games, I'm like, I don't think. look up a single thing about that game. Just go into it because you'll get spoiled and it ruins the whole purpose of the game. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the world ends with you would have been a good one too. Mm. Um, so. I don't know that one. The world ends with you. It's a gr very stylish DS game. I oh uh, man, like just I love the art style oh. of this book so much. I would have loved to see like like Silent yeah. Hill Shattered Memories rendered in <laughs> in this style or something like that. Yeah. Um, I also just kind of have my own kind of gaps personally that, you know, I, I wouldn't have thought to put in, but probably, you know, someone else would have, somebody else probably would have put more Sega games in here, um, uh, or more, um, you know, some more Microsoft games in here maybe, or someone with a, you know, with a, someone might've thought of a good, like Spectrum ZX game that should have been in here or something. Um, so I, you know, I have, I have my own background that I can't deny as, as much as I try to kind of include everything right. I think of. Um, do you, I mean, I know this book's like technically not even out yet and you might mm -hmm. not even be thinking about it, but do you plan on like writing more books? Do you have ideas of like what you would like to write about? Maybe you don't want to say uh, that yet. <laughs> yeah, I definitely have tons of ideas. And I guess to me, I guess saying I don't want to tease anything is in fact kind of a tease, but, uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to tease anything. That's no, that's totally fair, but just. You liked the process of writing the book. It's good to know that mm -hmm. you're you're thinking about that and have other ideas because I know we would gladly read them and buy those books. From this being your first book writing experience, Jordan, what would what looking back on the process? I know the book is not out yet, but um, what were your biggest takeaways, learnings that you will take into the next book writing experience? Um, it's definitely a good change of pace compared to the internet to have a lot of time to work on something. Um, again, you know, the bulk of the writing was in six months, but after that, after that initial drafting was done, there were still months and months of time I could kind of just marinate with it and go back to it and, and edit things and, and kind of really tweak it to this point where I feel like it's all like exactly how I want it to be versus well, on the internet, you just got to get something up and then if it's not quite perfect, like whatever, you just got to kind of live with that. Um, so having that amount of time was was really cool to have, um, and also also just compared to the internet where I'm you know I'm reviewing new games. Um, I said this in another interview, but I I really it really struck me how um, better and 
deeper and, and, and more thoughtful the opinions you can have on games that are old because you have had all this time now to see what they ended up being um, and their impact and how people have responded to them um, versus a game that, you know, it just came out. You don't know what it's going to turn into, you know? Right. Yeah. That's interesting what you said that about the older games because the minute I asked the question about uh, what years were easy, it's like, what a stupid question. Of course, it was obvious that Pac-Man and Super Mario Brothers and Legend of Zelda go in there. But, you know, I was thinking of, you know, the difficulty of choosing the games from the last 10 years. And because history is still being written and who knows what will end up, you know, I wouldn't have told you 10 years ago that Dark Souls would <laughs> largely shape the, the state of third-person action games today. But here we are. Mm -hmm. um, we've moved on from Batman Arkham Asylum combat, and we're now in the Souls era of combat. And so that's what's it's a, it's exciting. I think that's what's cool about this book is you both get a look at you know what is kind of written in stone and what is still a bit more moldable. Right, because a lot of the more modern chapters end up cheating in that way, and that I use them to talk about older games. Still, it's like the Segro chapter is on Souls games. You know, the Pokemon Go chapter. Um, it's about Pokemon as a whole and like kind of mobile gaming mm -hmm. and, you know, Animal Crossing was, you know, a very a different space. It was, it was, its impact was pretty immediately felt, but that's still part of a, of a long running franchise that mm -hmm. people have a relationship with. Yeah. And just different factors. I mean, you talk about like political and cultural factors yeah. that go into why a game is so successful and impactful. It's not always about the game. There's many different um, there's a lot of context around why a game is successful or not. Yeah, and it's also all subjective. I wanted to just, like, I, you know, I have opinions. I wanted to lean into that, you know. that's it's, game, Gamers love this idea of, like, objective quality, and it's like, that's all garbage. Like, yeah, what are you talking about? This, actually, it says Bible on the cover. I'm not, <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's really small and hidden, but you'll see it. This is the Bible of video game history. It's, there are no other opinions that matter. Right. Um, so yeah, just people should embrace that part of it. It's, it's, it's art. It's not just all, that, that, I mean, that was something that kind of was a big, um, driving force for me in, in making this in that as, as much as I do uh, like a lot of these other gaming history books, I feel like some of them take too much of an angle of just talking about it as a business and they almost make like executives, the protagonists of reality. Um, and I want, I want to write something that was very much like game forward about mm. you know it, it, i wanted to make it kind of like arts criticism in a way um that really talk about like why i think that this works and not just think of it as like this game was cool because it was a successful product you know like this right. game was cool because it did these things in its its art form what games in the writing process um required you know the most research versus ones that were a bit more easy to like come to, whether it's from through, from your own personal experience or mm -hmm. just kind of cultural osmosis. Like, were there certain games that require what games required more work to write about than others? Uh, yeah. So as, as as easy as it was to for these kind of older games to be the pick, like actually like nailing down the details of their development could be tricky because a lot of it wasn't being documented or. You know, I wrote about this game Speed Freak, and there's other games that are called that. And then it was all like, well, somebody was publishing it in North America, but then that wasn't the actual publisher. And it's all kind of up in smoke. Um, you know, a, a game like Pitfall that I, I knew vaguely. So a lot of the, my research is also just kind of just filling in the blanks of what I kind of generally knew the shape of the story to be. So like, I knew like a game like Pitfall was important because as, as a kind of a first third party game and as a sort of the birth of Activision there. But I didn't know like, you know, all the names of the people involved or the exact timeline of things or that like Jerry Lawson was involved in the lawsuit. Um, you know, another kind of connecting thread back to an earlier chapter. Um, so that was that was a big part of also just even talking about like making a book, working with like a fact checking team and a legal team to like verify information of like some of this game, some of this game stuff is, it can be hard to track down. Um, but yeah, you know, we, we got, we did, as, we did as well as we could. Yeah, you mentioned, I feel like it was the Super Smash Bros. Yeah, Museum mm -hmm. of the Year. You kind of talk about the whole concept of like, we're almost lacking what, like a video game museum, just like this center of like all this information, like what are all the games? You mentioned like there's games that have, there's multiple games with the same names. It's hard to find mm -hmm. information about a certain game. Um, but you do, t I just wanted to call it like, there's some institutions that are trying to um, overcome this, like the Institute 
strong national museum of play museum of the moving image and video game history foundation mm -hmm. um but yeah is do you have any thoughts there of like what are we missing when it comes to like keeping history of games was that kind of an inspiration behind this book something you had thought about before writing or just something that kind of you came to the a realization while you were writing it uh, that's something I've, I've thought about for a long time. I've talked about with a lot of the other people in this book. Um, a, a, a friend of mine, Tim Torres, who's in the book, he wrote a column years ago about just when all the, all the PT delisting stuff was happening of just mm -hmm. like how crazy and tragic video game preservation crisis is. Um, you mentioned the Video Game History Museum, uh, Frank Cifaldi, who I think helped run that. He had a story, he had a story in uh, the New York Times, I think, pretty recently about all that work. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm kind of taking from both of them here when I say that part of, part of the problem is technical, you know, games are not like movies where it's just, you're watching a, a video. It's like games need to be able to run on, if not the original hardware then something that can at least replicate it enough, mm -hmm. um, which is not always easy to do. Um, so there's, there's that, you know, that's a very real problem, but then also part of it is just greed and ignorant, like corporate companies not caring to make their games available. like. As much as I love Nintendo, they were like, we we know that we could potentially make more money by just making our games available for like limited amounts of time rather than just like having them available in perpetuity or like, you know, heaven forbid, like donating that, you know, like like a like a library where you can just actually just rent games for free because they're like important cultural artifacts, you know? Um I don't know. It's, it's the same issue with like, like trademark, you know, stuff going to the public domain, you know, all those deadlines getting pushed back further and further. Um, yeah. Like, companies see these things as, as, as they see that all as lost revenue and lost profit and not, they don't, they don't see that it, it, as a loss to culture to keep these things from being available to everybody. Um, but yeah, it's just like, I think it's everything you said is true. And that's why I think the importance of emulators like really shouldn't be, shut down like we saw the dolphin emulators being taken off the steam page mm -hmm. um it's just it's a real shame that so many people are, are losing out on decades of video games because of corporate greed um but yeah i i don't know i'm hopeful i i think something will happen like i'm not sure if the bubble has to burst but we'll get these games in some way. Hopefully Nintendo loses emulators. Could, <laughs> emulators are technically supposed to be legal anyways. Um, but yeah, it's, I'm glad there are those foundations out there that are working to preserve games. For sure. Yes, yeah, it's, it's all vital. It's all vital work. Yeah, because I'm, I'm thinking like, you know, if someone who hadn't played any of the games in this book, if they wanted to play all of them, that would be like almost impossible. <laughs> if they were just starting right now, like that would be like crazy. Yeah, it's I'm my the backlogs just continue to get backlogs. <laughs> so Jordan, kind of in closing and talking about the state of the industry and in preservation right now, um, we pulled this bit from the the forward or the intro about these games highlighted in the book being the best of the best, the most important and influential games, the games that foreshadowed the most profitable trends, and the games that tapped into the larger cultural and political moments. Many of these games mark shifts in the industry. Looking at, so before I ask the question, link to that, when did you finish the writing process, 2021, you said? Uh, yeah, that was that was most of it, yeah. But, you know, we were making tweaks up until, you know, the end of last year, basically. But. And so there are, you know, there are chapters 4, 21, and 22 in the mm -hmm. book as well. Looking at those two years, 2023, and, in, in, you know, putting in our, putting on our crystal ball, looking in, what do you see the trends being that shape the next 10 years of the industry? Um, I feel like we're kind of at an inflection point with a lot of this games as a service stuff. That's been a big thing for the past, you know, since Destiny. Um, I feel like people are, I mean, again, it might be just my opinion again, but I think people are kind of sick of that. Um, because also those are games that like, they can't just be like modest successes. They need to like be huge hits and like take over your life for like, months and years to kind of be worth the investment and i think that people just don't have the kind of bandwidth for that anymore um 
So I would hope that we get away from some of that. Because I just think that people in general should play a lot of games. They should play all sorts of games. They should play a different kind of variety of genre of games. Um, they should not just limit themselves to just kind of one thing. They should they should try to expose themselves to everything that that the medium can be. Yeah, and it's also it's kind of a gamble. I mean, you pay so much money for maybe a game. Sometimes they're free to play uh, <laughs> that are a promising game as a service, and then a year later they're like they're shut down because they just didn't perform as well as they had hoped. And it's just yeah, I I miss the days of just paying for one full game but i don't know yeah. i and it's just it's just good and it's finished yeah um and we've had i think we've had a, some of that this year we've had you know zelda uh you know Eld i mean elden ring was last year but like the re4 remake uh jedi survivor mm -hmm. and even even you know a game like hi-fi rush this year to me is super cool because it's just it's just great it just came out it's it's like half off yeah um it's just the thing you get in you get out and it was a great time um and it didn't i'm sure it probably didn't kill the studio to create it you know no, yeah. So like, more stuff God, like that. I've already forgot that was this year. I loved that game. Um, yeah, it was cool. I, I hinted at it earlier, but we were we were talking about this. You know how many massive games are coming out and whether it's sustainable. And it, it felt like a cool note to end the book on to highlight something smaller and as as unique as games come as uh, the Stanley Parable ultra mm -hmm. deluxe um that like you know we, we lo we've talked about elden ring great game but in a, like a year that had that or another game that i think is a little bit of bloated maybe not speaking for anybody else like horizon forbidden west oh yeah um, those games yeah whatever who cares yeah. right yeah. um but it felt like it was very cool to end a game with you know a year with so many huge games to pick something that has such a voice and can be beaten by anybody in just a couple of hours. And I, I felt like a cool flag to kind of, you know, we might be getting all of these things, but in, in, you know, from the indie space or from the, you know, smaller teams, we're getting things like Stanley Parable. And also as a game that's about games, which, yeah. you know, we have all sorts of history of, of movies that are about Hollywood and about the act of filmmaking and, you know, like, you know, uh, creative works that are about the creative process. Um, so having a, a game kind of continuing that tradition, I think is a good proof of maturity of the medium. Yeah, I love that. Give me the Babylon of video games. I was uh, just thinking that. I was like, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> and then you said it. I, I love like, that I understood gonna, that. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I was like, I wasn't yeah. sure if anybody would understand that other than Sam. <laughs> uh, the that might, people who saw it, yeah. That might be um, Ken Levine's new game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Judas, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, that'd be my guess. Well, I Sam, any other closing questions? I Jordan, is there anything else about the book we haven't touched on um, that you'd like to discuss, or that you you know really hope readers um, take away when mm -hmm. they get the get their hands on the book on July 11th? Um, I hope that no matter how much you know about games, whether you're like an expert or you don't know anything at all, um, I think that you would get a lot out of this. Um, I think that it, if, if, if you're just interested in the idea of really, again, like uh, as games criticism of just there, there being value in taking these, these games that we love so much that have brought so much to us for years and years and really like talking about them um, from, you know, an authentic, uh, authentic voice, you know, like we've seen so much with, with games writing this year of, of outlets getting shut down and kind of these, these critical voices being really devalued in favor of just like pure marketing um that i find really discouraging um so if, if you find if you find value in something that is not that that and, and, and just like actually like really appreciating the games um for everything that they are um then i hope you pick up this book and i hope that's what you get out of it well very well said and if you're listening to this and you would like to pick it up um this episode goes out june 30th and so just a couple weeks before the book is out on july 11th you can pre-order it basically everywhere books are sold. We'll have the links in the, the description of the podcast so you can check it out, order it, support Jordan. Um, and yeah, just get a little slice of video game history. Um, we hope you read it. Jordan, if they want to check out your other writing or your digital writing, where can people find you? Sure. They can go to PCMag.com. That is where I work full-time that's where all my video game opinions that are not in this book are going um they can check me out there perfect um any social media that you want to plug right now or 
Uh, I'm on Twitter at Jordan W Minor. I'm on Blue Sky. If <laughs> anyone else is on that, or if that even exists a month from now, <laughs> I um, hopefully it does. I still haven't gotten my invite. Uh, yeah, there's my Twitter up on screen. There, it's funny. That's a funny thing to see. <laughs> You're like, don't perceive me. Um, yeah. Well, definitely go check out Jordan. Read his writing. Um, Sam, where can people find you? You can find me everywhere at Sam Scott Mosher. And Caitlin, where can the people find you? They can find me at Caitlin Redwing everywhere. You can find the podcast now on YouTube at Real Time Strats and where you find all your podcasts. Um, we are also on social media on Twitter at Real Time Strats. And you can I email us. Oh, oh yes. I didn't Go want to step on your plug. Oh, no, you're totally also, fine. I have these little bookmarks that came in. They'll probably be events, probably in New York that there'll be details on hopefully by the time this goes up but okay. I want these. well keep it keep an eye out go to a little book event i miss going to those there's not as many in la i used to live in new york city and i used to go to book events because again nerd um but yes thank you everybody for listening um and till next time goodbye <laughs>